Well, I said earlier, today is the birthday of the church. We call it Pentecost, and we'll talk about what that word even means in just a minute. But Pentecost is, is talked about in Acts 2, and we'll read that in just a second. But the book of Acts is written by a guy named Luke. He was a doctor. He was a research guy. Like any doctor, he wants the facts. He wants to be able to analyze what's going on. And so he also wrote the gospel of Luke. And if you have read the gospels, you know that Luke's gospel is more detailed. It looks at things with a little more intensity than the other gospel accounts. Not that those other ones aren't important, but that was just his personality and the Holy Spirit used him to write that. Some say that the that Luke and Acts were all one book. They were just kind of two volumes, if you will, two letters that got sent. There was part one and part two. And so um, I, I want to just do a quick overview. In the very beginning of Acts 1, and we don't have all this, so just hang with me. I'm going to do like the supersonic overview of getting to Acts 2. So Acts 1, you know, Luke says, I, I produced the first account about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach. And sometimes we call Acts... Um, the, the uh, Acts of the Apostles. But if you read Luke and you read Acts and you kind of read them as a narrative, you begin to see that the common thread, the character that ties both of these books together uh, is not the Apostles. It's Jesus. This is the Acts. It really, it might be called the Acts of Jesus and the Holy Spirit on into the day that, that Jesus is being exalted through these accounts. And so, you know, in the introduction, you know, 40 days, Jesus has walked with them now. You know, he comes and says, you know, here I am. Uh, we've, had the, um, we've had Passover. We had the crucifixion. We had the burial. Three days, resurrection. And now Jesus has been with them 40 days. So that account's sort of shown in Acts 1. And he's walked among them and given proof that he's very much alive. He also gives some instruction in there too. Uh, Jesus begins to speak. The resurrected Jesus speaks. And he talks about restoring God's kingdom over the entire world and he calls Israel to follow him as he's walking with his disciples there in that land and, and, and he's enthroned then as king through his own death burial and resurrection Jesus in verse 8 of chapter 1 promises the spirit and, and that's uh, the passage that he says you know I'm, I'm going to send one uh, and he'll be just like me and he's going to give you power you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth when Jesus talks about this he's fulfilling prophecy that was given hundreds of years before one is found in Isaiah 32 I'm not going to read that right now you can look at it later Ezekiel 36 which I love I got to read Ezekiel 36 hang on Jesus fulfills this and, and, and reveals it in, in this, and it's recorded in this first part of Acts. He says that the Lord God, it's not, thus says the Lord God, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, it's for my character's sake, which you have profaned among the nations. I'm going to do something. You were imperfect in this process, in this religious thing. I'm going to do something incredible. And then it goes on down in Isaiah 36, uh, verse 26. It says, moreover, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a, a heart that's tender like flesh. I, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And you will live in the land that I gave you to your forefathers. You will be called my people and I will be your God. That's that fulfillment of covenant we've been talking about the last few weeks. And so there's that aspect of things there that, that is, and so that's brought about again in Joel 2. And you see this whole thing about what, when Jesus says, I'm going to send my spirit. You just wait on. And then you have what goes on. Uh, Jesus ascends into heaven and he's given them instruction, tells them what's about to happen, and he ascends. The ascension is something we don't talk about enough in the um, normal church anymore either, that we don't keep the calendar as well. But ascension, if Jesus had not ascended after the 40 days walking among his disciples, showing himself to be alive, we wouldn't have that account that says he ascended and now he's at the right hand of the Father. He's in a place of all authority right next to the Father and has now sent his Holy Spirit. The three are one. They are one mind, one purpose, one direction. And so you got all this going on. And now let's scroll ahead to Pentecost. Pentecost. 
We'll talk about this festival in just a second. Let me read Acts 2, 1 through 8. And you can read along with me. They're waiting. They've done what Jesus has said. They've taken instruction. They're gathered together. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a, a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance it wasn't them trying to work something up God was moving now there were Jews living in Jerusalem devout men also really from every nation under heaven that were honoring Yahweh and when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered. They were perplexed, some translations say, because each one of them was hearing those guys speak in his own language. And they were amazed. They were astonished, saying, why, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? We'll go back and revisit some of these things here. So we celebrate the birth of the church today and the coming of the Holy Spirit whom Jesus promised. Too many times we don't pay enough attention to this. Most felt this day just is not that important, but it's huge for us as Jesus follows. Significance here, the scriptures tell us otherwise. Jesus had asked his disciples to wait for this day. In John 16, 7 through 8, it says, Jesus is speaking, I tell you the truth. You, you ever say, Jesus never says, oh, I'm just kidding. He always says, I tell you the truth. Jesus came full of grace and truth. We talked about grace a little bit ago. Jesus is the truth. I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper or the comforter will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you and he when he comes will convict the world the whole system concerning sin righteousness and that there'll be a judging of the two there's judgment there's sin not doing it God's way there is God's way righteousness and there will ultimately be a judgment and the Holy Spirit comes to make this known bring this contrast to us it's the goodness of God showing up in the person of the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit has a specific task as the third person of the Trinity. And that specific task is that no one without the Holy Spirit would know they were lost and in need of a Savior. He brings that conviction, that awareness of the need. No one would understand the gospel we could tell the gospel all day long. It'd be like shining a light on the eyes of a blind man. It wouldn't bring out any result unless the miracle that the Holy Spirit brings to open the eyes of the hearts of people so that they can hear the place of need in their heart. And it says clearly, the Bible says this, that in 2 Corinthians, um, the God of this age, and that's little g, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. It is the role, it is the purpose, it is the job of the Holy Spirit to make known to us our, our great need. So not only do we see something happen here, but we wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be following Jesus or even have the ability without the fact that the Holy Spirit came upon these guys in the beginning back there in Acts. Well, three things. Number one, lives are transformed by the Holy Spirit. A lot of us can try to change. Anybody try to change? I used to have a bad habit. I tried to change. How'd that, how'd that go for you? Not very good. Thanks for your honesty. Transformation only happens Real change, depth of change only happens by the power of God in us, the Holy Spirit, 
working in us. Lives are transformed by the Holy Spirit. If you want to see change in your life, if you want to see change in someone else's life, don't try to manipulate them. That's not going to work, by the way. Human efforts won't do it. No matter how sincere, I don't care how diligent, how much you love your child, you're not going to change them. Now, you can lay out boundaries because the law kind of leads, it's a tutor that leads to Jesus. We're going to want that. But it's the Holy Spirit that gives that revelation. The problem is not with education. It has to do with our heart. And I'm not talking about the organ that pumps blood. I'm talking about the seed of our affections that all of us have. And we all have a love. And usually, it's me, right? What I think, what I feel, what I want. But the seed of our affection is to be a throne for a king. And only the Holy Spirit can make us aware of who needs to sit there. That conviction. And so, this change can only come through realizing that Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, that he is the king of the world, and he does love us greatly, which leads us then to repentance in that response to the conviction that the Holy Spirit makes us aware of. So we pray for our friends and our relatives. We ask God to be magnified and glorified. Hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom rule and reign come so that your will will be done. When we begin to pray in accordance with the will of God, and Jesus made it very clear, that's where we give room for the Holy Spirit to do His work. And so, this all happens at, at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit falls. So we see this change in the lives of a group of followers. As you go ahead and read Acts, somebody came to me after the first service and said, wow, I watched the movie Paul the other night, and I've already just been convicted to go back and read the book of Acts. And I thought, well, isn't that cool? Uh, anybody seen the movie Paul? I haven't yet. I've heard it's great. Take your tissues and be ready to be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's just a movie, but it's the retelling of actually Luke and Paul traveling together. So anyway, uh, just a quick commercial for uh, the Apostle Paul. We watch all kinds of really crummy stuff. Why not go see? Anyway, you got my point. All right. So back to the people who the Holy Spirit falls on here in in as they gathered in Jerusalem for this festival, we'll talking about the festival, there's a change that happens in the lives of a group of followers of Jesus in Acts 2. They were fishermen, and they were former fishermen. Not that there's anything wrong with fishermen. Some of them were former prostitutes, which God didn't want them to go back to that. You were formerly this, but now, because of grace, you are not this anymore. Some of them were former religious leaders, and religion will never really change anybody. So, transformation happens. Oh, yeah, and who else did you have? Tax collectors, the people who were thought least of in their culture. I don't even think we have anybody in our culture that we think that badly of. And all these people, the ragtag, the, the, the somebodies and the anybodies and the nobodies, the Holy Spirit comes upon them because they have devoted their lives to Jesus. They've obeyed the call of Jesus to wait upon that power. And God delivers because he always tells the truth. So, before Pentecost, they were weak, they were afraid, they lacked faith, like us. But by the embodiment, that very empowerment of the Holy Spirit, they began to walk in greater confidence in God, not in of themselves. And, 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 and they began to fully understand God's plan for them day by day, step by step, just as God wants that for us. So now the Holy Spirit is not just with them. God is for us and God is with us, but when the Holy Spirit comes upon that Jesus sends to those who believe in him, now we have God in us as well. And that's what they were experiencing. And so there was all this unity and Jesus starts bringing, uh, this diversity rather, and Jesus starts bringing unity out of that. So, so transform lives is the immediate thing that begins to happen. And this group is, at this point, and in the pages ahead, as Luke gives the account, are called the church, the way. And it was all born at Pentecost. And here we are today. So we're a part of it, in a way, 2,000 years later. So this couple things here. Pentecost. What in the world does this mean? Why in the world were these people all here? And so the rest of this we're going to look at in just a second. What is going on? 
Pentecost just means the 50th. means the 50th. So if you have, maybe if you had your 50th wedding anniversary, you could have the Pentecost anniversary. I don't know. It's called the Feast of Weeks. What it was was 50 days from the time of Passover, or in the case of the New Covenant, 50 days since the resurrection of Jesus. So Passover is a big festival that if you were a devout Jew, you went, you were required, if you lived within 20 miles of Jerusalem, you were required as a male to attend Passover, Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the fall. These were big feasts where they celebrated God. Now, also, there were two things about Pentecost, this particular festival when they gathered to worship God in Jerusalem. One was a... um, Basically, it it was a uh, historical significance. This is interesting. This is when they celebrated or remembered the giving of the law to Moses and then to the people of God. Some of us say, well, I'm under grace. I'm not under law anymore. No, no, I'm talking about the law of God, the moral law of God. I'm not talking about all the ceremonial stuff, like wash your hands now, do this, bow, do that. Uh, No, no, I'm talking about um, don't murder. Don't, don't steal from each other. Don't, don't lust after. Don't, don't commit adultery. Those things have not changed. Jesus said, I, I didn't come to abolish that. I came to fulfill. I came to fill you so you can keep that, not by your best efforts, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the giving of the law of Moses was celebrated at Pentecost. There was an agricultural um, uh, meaning as well. It was also the time of the great harvest. See, Passover, there was a, there was a grain offering offered. It was just a small grain offering. At, at, at Pentecost, there was the grain offerings came in because the barley harvest had come in. So there was a, there was a historical significance and there was a, a, an agricultural significance to Pentecost. Are you with me? So, since it was a required thing, there was a whole lot of people there. So, people from all kinds of places for this festival. And, and remember, Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Jesus had promised this faithful group who were there together in one place. So they were transformed. Then it happens. Suddenly, it happens. The second point that we see in this is the power the power to witness. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can even witness. Some of us think if we get a program just right, and and please don't hear me wrongly, sometimes it's good to have a strategy when we share the gospel. But I think in times past, over a history of I've been alive in the church, sometimes we forget it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the power to witness, not just that perfect program. Hi, hi, how are you? Do you know what you do if... uh, where you'd go if you died tonight. Um, And then we start in on trying to close the deal. Now listen, has God used that kind of evangelism? Absolutely. But I'm telling you, our best efforts will never accomplish what the Holy Spirit can do. In our daily life, where we work at the schoolhouse and at the courthouse and, 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 and in the marketplace, is we trust the Holy Spirit to empower us for witness. Are we even asking God to give me opportunity Give me a humble heart to depend on you that I don't force anything down anybody's throat because that's not going to stick anyway. That if I can be there to care for, be a listening ear, I'll be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within me. That all comes by knowing Jesus, the word, and being empowered and lived in by his spirit. And at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon them to be witnesses. We see it. We see it here. To witness effectively. You ever hear about the lady who went in with her watch, took it to the jewelry store? Maybe some of you have done this. It stopped running. So she took it to the jewelry store and she gave it to the jeweler and said, hey, my watch is not running. And, um, you know, how they do, they take it from you and say, I'll be right back. And they go back somewhere where they hide and do their stuff. Pull the magnifying glass. He comes back just like a couple minutes later and says, Here, here's your watch. It's running fine. I put a new battery in it. And she said, I've been winding this for two years. She, she, she was convinced it was her effort. It was her best efforts to keep that watch running. And sometimes 
in our process of following Jesus, we become convinced it's got to be my best efforts. Listen, we offer ourselves to God. That's as living sacrifices. We should always yield ourselves to God, but ain't going to get it done to use improper English. It's the power of God in us to be witnesses. Um, where was I? So this thing happens. There's a picture here too. So what sounds like a rushing wind happens. What looks like fire becomes and just lands on the heads of all these people gathered. And by the way, it's men and women. You can read about that in Acts 1. A little farther, I won't read it right now. But it says men and women were gathered. See, Jesus did something revolutionary. He came and brought the goodness of God, not just to men, but men and women. Nothing like that had happened before that time. We're not gonna go on that right now. I just want you to be encouraged. He made us in his image, both male and female. And he gives us his spirit. All right, so back to the thing. Back to this again. So, so suddenly there came from heaven a noise, violent rushing wind filled the whole place. And this is a picture. This is a completion of the picture that you see in Exodus 40. We won't read it right now. Second Chronicles 7, where there's prayer and the temple, the physical temple of God was filled with his presence. And one of the things that the manifestation of the power of God throughout the old covenant was fire. And that sense of his presence to the point that even the priests, the religious leaders couldn't even stand to minister because they were so overwhelmed by the power of God. And so the Old Testament temple, you see that when God came in power. And now all of a sudden, here's the New Testament people who've listened to Jesus, who saw him after the resurrection, who listened and obeyed his instruction and showed up there. And now God comes and fills the new temple, which is people devoted to Jesus, redeemed by his blood. And so we've got a picture of the Old Testament when it's filled and the New Testament, the picture of the fire of God by the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. And they begin to speak. And it says in this passage that there were Jews living in every place there. They come from all over the place. There were people who were proselytes uh, to Judaism. They were from other ethnic groups. And it says when all this happened, um, each one, they, they were bewildered because each one were hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed, verse 7 of chapter 2, and marveled, saying, Why, are not all these speaking, aren't they Galileans? And how is it that we hear them in our own language, this witness that they're gaining, and then it says, uh, with which we were born. And something hit me this week as I was reading some commentaries. Because most of us, because it's, it's just more convenient. When, when it says that they began speaking when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were speaking in tongues. That's what Luke reported. And we say, well, yeah, they were speaking the languages and those people from all those different places, right? I had to rethink that a little bit this week. Not that it changes a thing. It's still about the power of the Holy Spirit. They, they might have been making bold proclamations from their spirit that was in other tongues that might even have been a heavenly language but the Holy Spirit also interprets and those guys heard it and the only reason I'm saying that is this if you go to China today and you visit China there's all these different people groups and they speak different dialects right anybody been there and yet there's a trade language it's called Mandarin Chinese and so you can go places in China and if you can speak Mandarin and a lot of English they understand too, you can get through. Now, why am I telling you that? Because in this time period, historically, the trade language in Jerusalem was either Aramaic, remember Jesus spoke Aramaic, or the other language of that whole region of the world was Greek. Why did they have to speak in other tongues and other languages? I propose that maybe they didn't at all. Missionaries have found out that if you go to a country and you go to a culture, we tend to think we're all Americans, so we speak English, but you know it even is different in different parts of the country, the way we speak. It's even more so in different places like Africa and Asia. So if you think you're just going to go to China and just speak to everybody, 
What they found is if you bring the gospel, if you bring the love of God in the gospel of Christ to people in their heart language, oh, the Spirit of the Lord can do a great thing. Whole people groups have been brought to Christ by people who will take the time and love that people and learn their heart language, not just a trade language. Are you with me? I believe after just reading this again this week, that those people began to proclaim the greatness of God out of the depths of their heart. I don't know what it looked like. All I know is what Luke reports is they heard it in their language. And I propose to you that I believe they heard it. You may say, big deal. It is a big deal to me because he still works that way today. That they heard it in their heart language. They heard it from their people group, from their tribal group, that when they began to hear the praises of God spoken, that's the miracle of the power of the Holy Spirit in this story. Or it wouldn't be as miraculous. Why didn't they just, we had the guys over here going, proclaiming the greatness of God in Aramaic, and the guys over here proclaiming it in Greek. Well, we got, we got it all covered. Because it speaks of the great love of God for us as individuals, and for people groups, for the nations. He said this gospel will be preached, Matthew 24, 14, this, and this gospel will be preached unto the nations as a witness. And then the end will come. And we think if we can just go out there and broadcast on radio, the fact there's two billion people on the planet still don't know the good news of Jesus. How could that be? Honestly, I think God by the Holy Spirit wants to take us as his agents and learn heart languages. Okay, I just did a missions message on the top of the whole thing. Anyway, it still takes the power of the Holy Spirit to be powerful witnesses in this day and time as well this day and time well, I just lost my place and you'll be my witnesses all over the place this celebration of the law of God that brings us to the knowledge that we need Jesus he still wants to take it to every nation language and tribe so so um, Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians 2, he speaks of the need of the Holy Spirit. He says, And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words, words of wisdom, but, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. I don't think Paul was a show-off. I think Paul came declaring with the empowering of the Holy Spirit. It says, Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men. It, that wouldn't be the fulcrum, but on the power of God. Do we need to be wise? Do we need to be well-versed? Absolutely. But more than anything, we need the Holy Spirit to be empowered, to be witnesses in this day and time. Well, lastly, the Spirit establishes a unique fellowship. I mean, we're here today, 2,000 years after Pentecost, because what the Holy Spirit does See, if not, we would just be another group. We could be another club. We could be another service organization without the Holy Spirit. We wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. But what God intends for us to be unique on is to be filled with his very character and nature, the very name of Jesus. And you see this. You see this among these people that as they continue to walk and you read Acts and I would encourage you to think about reading on into Acts you see what they did empowered by the Holy Spirit and as a group of people arms and legs and hands and feet of Jesus and regarding him as the head the world was turned upside down a matter of fact Acts 2 36 through 44 therefore let all the house of Israel Peter's finishing up a message so am I um, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you crucified. He's explaining what was going on there without reading all of that. What he's saying is, this is not just another religious leader. This is not just another good teacher that will tell you about God. This, let all Israel know that 
God the Father has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ. In our culture, when it's all about a group of us and we make all the decisions, we don't understand sovereignty and rulership. But what he's saying is, it's decided. This resurrected Jesus is now king. And, oh, by the way, you crucified him. I don't think he's trying to lay a guilt trip on him. He's just saying, this is, this is how serious this is. And now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what, what brethren, uh, so men and women, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, change your mind. And, and each of you be baptized in the name, the very character, be immersed in the character of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What will, must we do? I'm not king. This is not a place for me to sit on the throne. God's given me the will and the freedom. But if you want real change, repent. Change direction. You were going this way. What I think, what I feel, what I want. And all of a sudden, wait a minute, this king has a better way. What does he think? What does he feel? What does he want? Repentance is not only a change of mind, it's a change of direction. That's the good news of the gospel. When we hear it, and empowered by the Spirit to convict us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He says, come on, come to me, all you weary and heavy laden, come on. Go ahead and, and oh, make your commitment public. Be baptized in, the, in, in, in this authority of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God, not only for you and with you, but God in you. For the promise is for you, this is good news, and for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. There again, that's the work of the Spirit of God. And with many other words, he solemnly testified, and he kept exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Don't look like the rest of it. Don't do it like the rest of it. Be redeemed and bought out of it. This is the empowerment. This is the unity that the Holy Spirit gave these people who were kind of weak and cowering. And now God comes on. Be saved from this. So then those who had received his word were baptized. And that day were added about roughly 3,000 souls. And they were continually. Here's, here's the uniqueness of the fellowship. Hear this. Acts 2.42. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is about Jesus. This is not a bunch of men's opinions. The apostles' teaching is about the character of God as revealed in Christ. They kept devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, which, by the way, is not just coffee and donuts. That's a good place to start. We have that every week. It's available. But it's so that you'll sit down and get to know one another. It's what life groups are for. Can I just say this? Uh, I'm about done. I would be done quicker if I didn't have all these little offshoots. But I want to encourage you as the people of God. Gathering together to celebrate the goodness on Sunday is wonderful. And it brings encouragement. But don't miss the opportunity. And it's our habit, in Sheridan particularly, to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be, well, we're not going to meet because this is not convenient. Do as much as you can to keep your fellowship strong in your small groups through the summer. That's all I'm going to say about that. Because right. so, right. it's important. It really is. It strengthens us. So to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship and to the breaking of bread, uh, that's not just taking communion. That's part of it. That, would, that means we've got to get together to do that. Um, and, and to prayer. Praying for one another. Praying with one another. That's where life groups are so important. Because it's not just a Bible study. It's not just a prayer meeting. It's not just coffee and donuts. It's doing life together around the word of God. Hearing one another's hearts. Praying for one another. Celebrating the answers when they... You know, if you haven't done that lately, take time to do that. Uh, not just supplication, but thanksgiving. Uh, I'm not beating you all up, by the way. I, I'm excited about what God wants to do. Because when we allow him to, we become this unique entity. This this establishing a unique fellowship that the Holy Spirit desires to do. Let us not quench. Let us not grieve the Holy Spirit. See, it's God who's at work to, to will and to work in you his good pleasure, okay? It's all about him. But we can either 
participate and yield and cooperate, or we can put our heels in and say, oh, wah, 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 wah. but rather, let us be grateful. Let us rejoice that we can come together. Let us not forsake the assembling together of one another as the habit of some, but even so much more because the days are evil and the day of his return is certain. Let's be girded up in everything he has for us. Let's be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit which came upon those folks back there at that Pentecost celebration so many years ago. Now, I want you to just stand with me this morning. By the way, some more of the story is down the road they grew to 5,000 people not long after that. And these, it was really intentional on God's part because God's really intentional. But these people who gathered for that feast were from all these different places with all these different ethnicities and all these different heart languages so they could go back and take this great message of the love of God. Because what they heard them speaking was the glory of God in their heart languages. You are in unique places. Some of you are from Sheridan, some of you aren't. Some of you might be as far away from Buffalo, like, you know, someplace like that, or farther. But God's intentionality is that this unique fellowship that he's established through the Holy Spirit is that we would be his people, that love and care, number one, for each other, how we treat one another. And then, oh, because he even says, They'll know you're my disciples, not just some religious group, by the love you have for one another. And then how we reach out to those around us, not to manipulate, not to just preach at, but to live and to serve like Jesus and be prepared to give the answer because it is important to be able to speak and be able to share the gospel, the good news that in the midst of our hopelessness in the midst of our sin and slavery Jesus came the grace of God appeared bringing salvation to all who will hear and repent and respond walk by faith with him and he's got more for us as the people of God so this morning if you're here this morning and and you're just uh Maybe you're thirsty. Maybe you're dry and you're worn out, like being out in the desert and you need the shade on a summer day. Maybe you feel alone and you need to know the fellowship of a family. And I can't fix all that, but God wants to do things in us. He first wants us to believe in the Son, King Jesus, who paid the price for our sin. And as we believe on him as we turn from our way confess our sin he is just to forgive us and adopt us that we enter into this new covenant into his family and then he gives us the gift of his very himself the Holy Spirit that we might be empowered I just want to remind you this morning I just want to exhort you that all that are for those who've turned from their way and turned his way salvation is available to all who will trust in the work of Jesus. But maybe you're just tired and worn out. I'm just asking, Lord, would you just fill me fresh today? Like a cup of cold water? Lord, would you just pour your spirit out on me? Jesus, would you just afresh anoint me with your spirit today? Lord, so that you'd be glorified for the sake of your name. Don't give him a whole list of all the things that you think you need to go do for him. Just to start with, God, for the sake of your name, would you do, would you be fresh in me today that I might represent you rightly, that I might glorify you, that I might walk as a child, blessed, anointed, anointed, highly favored because you've provided everything for me pertaining to this in Christ and in the spirit of Christ. Would you just trust him today? He gives grace to the humble. And His grace is sufficient. Just take time. Maybe you need to sit. Maybe you want to continue to stand. Just offer yourself fresh to Him. Let's just invite the Holy Spirit. Just come and fall fresh on each of us. There
there's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're a living world. Your your presence that comes sometimes like a fire to burn out the impurities the things that we hold on that we think are our security and yet you say no 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 that's not it it's me Lord help us when we're depending that way Lord help us tomorrow not just today in this place surrounded by the people of God but tomorrow the desire and to invite you Holy Spirit come Lord make us hungry to see your glory made known not just to see miracles and wonders but Lord, that you'd be glorified, that we would just call on you, that your name, that your presence, that your greatness, that you'd be glorified in us as your children. Lord, you've adopted us by the precious blood of Christ. Lord, and by faith we come, and by faith we continue to come, and by our admission of need, you pour out more grace, and Lord, you don't run out. So now may your grace, your very Holy Spirit, Fill us fresh to go be to our families, to our workmates, to our classmates, that we would look more like you, Jesus. And we need you, Holy Spirit, for that. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, set you aside for his purpose. And may his spirit and may our spirit and may our soul and body be preserved complete because of his work without blame at the coming, this next coming of Jesus, our Lord. Faithful. Faithful is he who calls you. And 
No, by the way, he'll bring it to pass by his power, by his Holy Spirit. Encourage one another. Strengthen one another. Pray for one another. Assemble together. Encourage one another in the teachings of Jesus and in the fellowship by the Holy Spirit. And continue to give him thanks and ask and believe that he is able to do far more than we can think or even imagine because he loves and he's good and he wants to see more people come to know him. God bless you as you go today. If you need prayer, we're going to be around here. Some of you might need to just gather as some groups or whatever, as families. I don't know. But let's just trust God with all that he has given us. Amen.